Rob, thank you for that. Uh, can I add my uh, welcome to Jacob uh, this morning? It's lovely to have everyone here with us uh, this morning. Um, a few weeks ago when Michael Ott's with us, he introduced us to Slido and the opportunity to ask questions sort of anon anonymously, if we want, of the speaker. So you'll notice on the slide um, there is a, a, a what are they call QR code uh, and a hashtag. If you go to slido.com on your phone or if you take a picture of that, you'll go to the page. There's an opportunity to, to ask questions of anything really that is said or, or done this morning. Um, and we hope to be able to address those um, either uh, after the service um, this morning or um, um, Sunday evening or sometime over the next few weeks. As we come to this section of 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14. Now, someone's got the zapper. Brilliant, thanks. My guess is that most people know this uh, uh, person. Uh, not so much the character, Mr. Bean or Johnny English, but the actor, Rowan Atkinson. What you may not know is that he came to public notice really now uh, about 40 years ago, terrifying to think of that, in a program called the Not the Nine O'Clock News. Now, this was the days when there was only BBC One and BBC Two. Uh, the main news, BBC One, was on at nine o'clock, and this was the alternative, the alternative comedy of the day, not the nine o'clock news. I was reminded of uh, a sketch uh, done in this programme this week as I came to these chapters in 1 Corinthians. Um, it poked the fun at uh, a popular consumer affairs programme of the time called That's Life. I don't know if anyone here remembers it. It was hosted by um, Esther Ranson, she of Childline fame. I was reminded of the sketch, really, because it highlights some of the dangers we face when we come to these uh, pages, these chapters uh, in 1 Corinthians. I say famous, really, I should probably say infamous, uh, because they've been at the root of a huge amount of controversy uh, in the church in recent times. If you can think back to the last time you had a conversation with anyone about the content of these chapters, I'd be very surprised if that discussion wasn't of some disagreement or other. Almost every disagreement in the evangelical church over the last 40 years or so can find fuel for the fire in these verses. And not just in the UK, but around the world. Uh, disagreements over them have somewhat ironically, as we'll see, uh, split churches and led to Christians falling out with one another. Uh, it's a discussion and argument that's uh, produced, uh, generated a lot of heat, uh, but often very little light. So I confess I come to these chapters this morning with a degree of trepidation. My prayer is that as we dig into them over the next uh, few weeks, uh, we'll generate more light than heat. And uh, rather than it leading to discord and division, uh, we'll, it will lead to greater agreement and unity. And make us more able to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit that we were looking at only a couple of weeks ago. Forbearance, kindness, gentleness, self-control to those brothers and sisters in Christ with whom we may disagree over some of the details. Now, I think, as I say, there are several challenges as we come to these chapters. Uh, I'm going to list four as we begin, uh, if you'll allow me to. The first is the preconceptions that we have as we come to these chapters. Now, we all have them. We all carry with us our own baggage, born of previous teaching, previous experience, understandings, misunderstandings. And that can sometimes blind us to what the text is actually saying. I mean, that's always the case when we read the Bible, actually. Um, but it's particularly uh, apparent, I think, in, in these chapters. Most churches in recent decades have wrestled with the issues in these chapters. And most will have come to a settled view over them. It makes it difficult to look at it afresh. I remember when I was a final year medical student, I had a six-week placement at Hereford Hospital. 
Uh, and one Sunday, looking for churches, I went into town, I went into one particular church, was welcomed by someone at the door, whose the first thing he said to me was, we believe in all 18 gifts of the Spirit here, and we practice them all. What about you? And I thought, well, that's an interesting, uh, interesting approach to a welcome team. But clearly, they'd thought about these things, and they'd come to view on them. So one challenge is our preconceptions. The second challenge we face as we come to these chapters is that they are chapters uh, in the middle of a much larger book. And we're jumping, uh, not quite at the end, but quite a long way into, into uh, an involved discourse. And it would be a surprise, I think, if some of the things that Paul hadn't said already to the church didn't have a bearing on what he's saying here. What he said already is relevant, uh, and we'll need to take uh, uh, note of that. Thirdly, uh, it bring, uh, the third challenge, I think, brings us back to that's life and not the nine o'clock news. The sketch went something like this. The four comics spoofed the life, uh, that, um, That's Life program, saying that they'd received a letter from a Mr. and Mrs. Robinson from Harrow on the Weald. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Robinson had bought a fridge from the electricity board, bought it and filled it with food. It was then that they had a series of disasters. Their son had appendicitis, a freak typhoon tore off the side of the house. Uh, Mr. Robinson was shot by a police marksman. Mrs. Robinson was attacked by a killer whale and her mother hit by a meteorite. In the sketch, on each occasion disaster struck, Esther or one of her team championing the consumer's cause phoned the electricity board. And on each occasion, Rowan Atkinson Speaking for the electricity board, and I won't do the voice, you'll be pleased to know, he said, I'm sorry, this really has got nothing to do with us. It's all too easy to come to these chapters with questions that just don't fall within the remit of, the, of, of what Paul's talking about. We may have lots of different questions, valid questions, and want answers to them, and that's fair enough. All manners of questions about charismatic gifts and their practice. But if our questions are not directly addressed by these chapters, if they're not the questions that the Corinthians are asking or that Paul is answering at this point, it would be foolish, wouldn't it, to expect that the answers, all the answers to our questions are here. Uh, you might as well look at your till receipt from the weekly shop for yesterday's football results. You can look, look as hard as you like, you won't find them. That's not what a, till is a, a, a bill is about. Now, that's not to say that the questions that you may have aren't important ones. They may well be. Uh, and that's why we've set up Slido to, uh, as an opportunity to, to ask them. But we need to be realistic about what Paul is saying and the limits of the discussion. And if, as we look at the questions that the Corinthians are asking Paul and that Paul is answering, if in the process we find that they're not the ones that we're always asking, well, with humility, we'll have to accept that, won't we? And resist the temptation to conclude we have all the answers when we don't. And it may be, actually, we find we're answer, asking the wrong questions. So, for example... We might approach the list in verses 8 to 10 of chapter 12, the list of the phenomena discussed in verses 8 to 10, and we get another list at the end of the chapter in verses 28 to 30. And the question we may have, what is, what, what's Paul talking about and what's the place in the church today? And I don't think they're unreasonable questions to ask. But if that's not the question that Paul is answering here, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that we don't necessarily get all the answers we'd like. Now, I'll put my cards on the table at this point. I don't think we get much of an explanation here of what these phenomena are. We almost get, we get no information about what he means by message of wisdom, message of knowledge, gifts of healing, miraculous powers. 
He does give us some more information when we get to chapter 14, about two of them, tongues and prophecy. Um, but pretty much nothing about the others. And I don't think we should feel hard done by there or frustrated or disappointed because it's not an accident what Paul says or a failure on God's part. If he'd wanted to tell us, he would have done. He, Paul could have said more, but he didn't. Which might suggest, as I say, that our questions are not necessarily the most important ones. And we certainly shouldn't use the paucity of information to come up with definitive answers of our own. The fourth and final challenge, and we will get to the text in a moment, the fourth challenge we face, rather frustratingly, is one of translation. Now, I think it's always a bit tedious, isn't it, when preachers go on about translations and things. Um, but it, it, these are one of the points where I think we can't but avoid it. In, verses 12, in verse 1 of chapter 12, in an attempt, I think, for the translators to help us, they talk about <laughs> spiritual gifts. And as we read this first chapter, at first glance, it seems to be that it is all about spiritual gifts. So, for example, if you've got an NIV in front of you, the title that the editors have put in to try and help us is Concerning Spiritual Gifts. And 12 verse 4, we're told there are different kinds of gifts. And if we go into chapter 14, which is all part of this section, we're told at 14 verse 1, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. 14 verse 12, since you are eager for the gifts of the Spirit. So, given that, perhaps it's not surprising that when we read it, we think that the chapter is all about spiritual gifts. And I have to fess up here. Um, I don't know, you may have, some of you may have seen, probably no one sees it, but that was a banner I put on Facebook at the beginning of last week when we were coming to these chapters, Gifts of the Spirit. And then, having looked at the chapter, I thought, well, that's a bit misleading. I think, actually, I need to change it. It's not about spiritual gifts. He's talking concerning gifts. Actually, what I should have put at is now concerning spirituals, but I didn't put that on, on Facebook because I thought everyone thought I'd have lost the plot. What nurse is he talking about? But actually, that's the word that is used here. We do get the word for gift, charisma, from, what, from which we get charismatic, in verse 4. So he is talking about gifts, and he does have something to say about the distribution of those gifts, which we'll come to in a moment. But it's not the word used in verse 1. Which means, I think, that Paul isn't primarily addressing the question of gifts. He uses a word, pneumaticon, um, which does carry with it the idea of spiritual but not that of gifts. Indeed, the phrase spiritual gift that we're so familiar with, aren't we? It sort of rolls off the tongue. Those two words, spiritual and gift, don't appear anywhere in these chapters. We do get the talk of charisma gift, but it's never called spiritual gift. In every other case, in every other case in these chapters, this other word, pneumaticon, is used. And you might say, well, why does that matter, Martin? You're just splitting hairs, aren't you? I think it matters because if we don't acknowledge that if we, up front, if we think everything he's saying is about spiritual gifts, then we in risk being heading off in the wrong direction. Paul isn't primarily talking about spiritual gifts. He is addressing the Corinthian misunderstanding about what it means to be a spiritual person. And that is perhaps why, when we get into it, he has very little to say about the individual gifts themselves. That's not his prime concern. And I think it helps us remember that as we come to the text. And it helps us to remember, I think, that the Corinthians were an incredibly gifted congregation. Now, if you just want to 
me to prove that to you, just flip back to chapter 1, will you, where Paul writes them right at the beginning of the letter, chapter 1, verses 4 to 7, he says, right into the Corinthian church, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. This church is an incredibly gifted lot, these brothers and sisters. But it had to be said, as a result, they were rather self-satisfied and rather pleased with themselves for the gifting that they had, or at least some of them were. So we see, actually, that they're a very gifted lot, but we also see, if we read these earlier chapters, that as a church... They're in a complete mess. Their giftedness has led to pride. Their arrogance, Paul uses the phrase, puffed up. And they were arguing about all sorts of things. They were arguing about who was the best celebrity preacher. There was a church that was riven with social snobbery. There was jealousy and quarrelling. There was drunkenness at the Lord's table. There was toleration of gross immorality. They were taking each other to court. They were confused about marriage. And they were falling out with one another about how to best engage the surrounding culture with the gospel. They were boastful. They were self-serving. There was conflict. And there was division. It was a mess. When someone I worked with would say, it was a mess. And now, to cap it all, There are arguments about what it means to be spiritual. You see, some people, it seems, consider themselves, well, something of a spiritual elite because of their more spectacular gifts. And they were looking down on others because, well, they didn't have these gifts. They had other ones. So they're writing to Paul where one group of the church is saying, in effect, it's true, isn't it? that really spiritual people do really spectacular things. That's what one group was saying. And the other group was saying, surely, Paul, that isn't true, is it? That these particular manifestations of the Spirit are evidences of being a more spiritual person. That's the situation. They're the issues. That's what Paul's writing into. And he wants to correct their muddled thinking what he calls infantile thinking later on in chapter 14. He wants to correct their thinking whilst at the same time uniting the warring parties, healing the divisions. So chapter 12, verse 1. Now about the spiritual things, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. How does Paul try and put things right and cure the division well first you see verse 2 he reminds them that before they were Christians when they were pagans they were profoundly ignorant about spiritual things and he doesn't want them to be ignorant anymore see see, those who see some gifts uh, as an exclusive authentication of the spiritual life and want Paul to agree with them And those who are sceptical about those gifts and are not so sure about them or their place in church life, perhaps because of their pagan backgrounds uh, and experience of similar things, chapter 8 to 10 may be relevant here, and want Paul to back them, he reminds both groups, verse 3, that all believers are spiritual. They're all indwelt by the Spirit. And if you've been with us over the last few weeks, he said, looking at the Spirit, Holy Spirit, as we hear and learn of him in Galatians, he said that again and again and again in that letter, hasn't he? Which means that everyone, everyone on both sides of this argument, all of those who truly confess Christ as Lord, participate in the things of the Spirit. Okay? They're spiritual. Got that? Every Christian has that experience. But... That does not mean that everyone is the same. That there are no spiritual differences between them. And so verse 4 and 5. Because, rather, they've received from God, 
Father, Son, and Spirit here, note, verse 4 and 5, different gifts, different works of service, different kinds of work to be done. So you see, some are feeling a bit superior. They think they're the special ones because they have superior gifts. Some are feeling a bit inferior. They don't have what the other lot have and that they think are superior and are beginning to believe the hype and feeling a bit inferior and therefore vulnerable. Both groups need to get several things clear. I've got six things that Paul, six correctives that Paul gives in the verses that follow, so stick with me. Firstly, remember both groups, they're gifts. Well, you say that's obvious. Well, obvious perhaps, but something that the Corinthians seem to have been forgetting. If there are differences between them, and there are, it's not a cause for boasting. It's due to what you've been given. It's a cause for thankfulness, not boasting. And as Paul said uh, earlier in the book, chapter 4, verse 7, in a slightly different context, but relevant here, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you, do not that you have not received? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you did not? There's no cause for boasting here. There's difference, but no cause for boasting. There's nothing to boast in, except the one for whom the gift, from whom the gift has come. He who, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So firstly, remember, both, both of you, they're gifts. Secondly, remember, these gifts are given by God to his people as he alone determines. So verse 4. If we have any given gift, or if we don't have it, neither of that is down to us. It's down to God. His gift, his choice. The distribution is in his hands. And reflects the generosity of the giver, not the status or merits of those receiving it. You see, the Corinthians were getting themselves into a mess. They seem to be thinking that the more spectacular gifts, especially, as we'll see in, when we get to chapter 14, the gifts of tongues and interpretation of tongues, that those who had these more spectacular gifts were, some, were more spiritual, you know, cut above the rest. Whilst those who didn't have that particular gift and being made to feel, well, inferior, less spiritual. You see, if, if within a congregation some gifts are perceived as more valuable than others and others less valuable, it, it's, a, it's a short step, isn't it, to begin to think that those with the gifts are more valuable and those without them less so. And you get a bit of a ranking going on. But you see here, Paul will have none of that. Possessing any gift does not reflect, does not reflect on the owner only on the generosity of the giver. Thirdly, third point he wants both groups to know. No one is giftless. All believers have God's good gifts. Verse 6 to 7. In everyone, every Christian that is, it is the same God at work. To each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given from God. And again, verse 11. The Spirit distributes gifts to each one just as he sees fit. So God gives these gifts as he determines, and he gives them to each and every believer. No one is left out. And it's worth, I think, pointing out, not necessarily just one gift. I mean, in the list at the end of the chapter, we get, that we get a list of apostles, being an apostle is a gift, but we know that some apostles also performed miracles uh, and performed healings. And Paul says later on that he himself speaks in tongues. So clearly the, the apostles had more than one gift. And actually, it's interesting to note that Paul's first use of the term gift, charisma, in 1 Corinthians, comes not in this chapter, but chapter 7, where the gift is of singleness and of marriage, two gifts. So each of us at least had one of those gifts. We don't need to hunt around looking for our gift, worrying that if we don't discover it, 
you know, we'll miss out. Chances are, in God's grace and generosity, we've got loads. So let's just get on and use them. Verse 4. Fourth thing he wants both groups to know. There is a huge diversity of gifts. A huge number. So verse 8 to 1, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, speaking in tongues, in different tongues. And still another, the interpretation of tongues. And we get another list at the end of the chapter, verses 28 to 30, where, and I think this is interesting, some of those here are repeated, and some of them are left out, and new ones are added. So neither list that we have is exhaustive and complete, and if we look elsewhere in the New Testament where we get lists of gifts, well, there are loads of other ones not mentioned here. There is a huge diversity of gifts. Fifthly, fifth point, uh, and I alluded to this earlier, we're given very little idea, aren't we, of what some of these mean. I, it's striking how little information we get. As I say, we'll learn more of tongues and prophecy in chapter 14. But it's worth reflecting, I think, that the Corinthians will have known what Paul was talking about and referring to, what the phenomena he was referring to, and clearly Paul knew what he was talking about. And so if, if, we, if we're not told, if we're left in ignorance... It may be frustrating. Actually, I think it's quite liberating, isn't it? You see, if God, through Paul, doesn't tell us the details, it must mean we don't need to know, mustn't it? If we believe, as the New Testament affirms, that God has given us in Scripture everything we need for salvation and godliness, and then he doesn't tell us something, well, the implication, surely, isn't it, that it isn't that important? We don't need to know. If we did need to know, he would have told us. Now, we may have our own ideas, lots of people do, and we may like to speculate, many people do. But we need to remember in doing that that they are ideas, and we may very possibly be wrong. And sometimes we need to acknowledge that we just don't know things. But what we don't know shouldn't distract us from what we do know. What do we know? There are lots of different gifts. They're given by God to each believer as he chooses. A cause for thankfulness, not boasting. And sixthly and lastly, why does God give gifts to his people? And now we're getting to the heart of it. Verses 12 to 21 the heart of the problem at Corinth and Paul's solution to it. You see, the Corinthians knew there were lots of different gifts. But their assessment of these spiritual things, if you like, were wrong. Some thought they were more spiritual than others because of the gifts they had. Others thought they were less so. But those who possessed these more spectacular ones thought they were more important, more significant and they were feeling superior. They were in the room where it happens, as Hamilton might have said. But some were feeling inferior, shut out of the room, less important, less significant, less spiritual. Both groups are wrong. Verse 12, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ, with Christ's body. So like a body with different parts, different people in a congregation have different gifts. But they're all equally part of the whole. And all equally necessary, equally needed for the body to function as it should. Verse 18, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Now, if you're feeling insecure, if you think you've got a lesser gift, stop it. It won't do, according to Paul. God has given you your gift. You do belong 
You are in the room. The body needs you. Everybody needs everyone else. And if you're sitting there feeling a bit smug and self-important, stop it. And use your gifts for what they've been given to serve your brothers and sisters. That's what they're for. They're not for you. They're for them. Now, apologies if you think this illustration is a bit, is a bit trivial. I'm not trying to trivialise things. But I couldn't th- help thinking this week of Mr. Potato Head. No, from the Toy Story films. And of how he struggles in the films, doesn't he, when part of him goes missing. He needs every part to function properly. It'd be hopeless if he were all feet, or if he was all eyes and mouths. If any part of him is missing, it doesn't work. Incomplete. Verse 18. God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they're all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. If you've been given one of the more spectacular gifts and attempted to think that you are somehow superior to those who've been given different gifts, tempted to think that actually you don't need those who aren't gifted in the same way as you are, you couldn't be getting things more wrong. Verse 22, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. Stop setting up divisions amongst you. Stop thinking some are better, more spiritual than others. You with the more spectacular gifts, stop bigging yourself up. Stop thinking you're the bee's knees, that somehow you're worthy of special honour. You've got things completely the wrong way around. The reverse is the case. Those that you're looking down on, they should be receiving greater honour. Verse 24, God has put the body together giving greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body. But its parts should have equal concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Well, we're out of time. Let me just try and summarise. Paul is addressing a live issue at Corinth, one that's causing confusion and shameful division. Some are thinking they're better than others, puffed up about their more spectacular spiritual gifts. They're attaching to their gifts more significance and to themselves a greater status than those who have other gifts, who are therefore feeling inadequate. One lot feeling special and proud, and the other lot feeling inferior and excess to requirements. And Paul will have none of it. The proud need to realize that all they have is from God that they have received it, their grace gifts, not to make themselves special, not to show that they're more spiritual, but for the sake of the body, the whole, others. And those whom they regarded as the little people, people who were feeling inferior, worrying perhaps that they were. Paul will have none of that either. They need to realise they're no less important, no less needed, no less honourable. The church then, as now, needed to realise that there are no small people in God's household. And it's interesting to reflect, I think, 
the suggestion here that the maturity of a congregation is measured here at least in large part by the honour it gives to those whom others might dismiss. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the grace that you've given us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that the Spirit indwells all the people of God, that he brings us to faith uh, and blesses us in so many ways, gives us a hope in the gospel uh, and love for one another and for you. And we pray, Heavenly Father, as we reflect on these, these chapters that have caused so much, ironically, so much division in recent years, we pray that we may be ever more united in Christ using the gifts that God has given each and every one of us, but for the sake and service of our brothers and sisters. And we ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Thank you.